Today we look back at a great revenge story over a decade later. We'll get into that in a bit, but first, jerk neighbors put up their house for sale today on my birthday. My jerk next door neighbors who have repeatedly called the city about my property over the last couple of years. The city inspector and zoning lead of my city have literally called them insane and have personally apologized to me over their actions. Kicked my dog, called the police on another neighbor's dog, stalk me when I walk my dog, literally stare into my windows, email and text me accusing me of things I've never done, tried to rally other neighbors into hating me, this backfired epically, put up their house for sale today on my birthday. Over the years, I've taken a few steps of petty revenge, such as playing my music extra loud when they would be in the yard, allowed my dog to poop in their front yard, park my car in front of their house, they get ticked about this, it's a public street, and have won every argument they've tried to call into the city. Lately, I won a zoning argument they tried to call about, and the city gave me a permit to finish the work done on my house. This literally was the last straw for them to move out of my neighborhood. Ironically, they put it up for sale today, on my birthday. Poetic justice at its finest. You want to talk about memorable and priceless gifts? Those annoying neighbors finally up and moving out? I completely understand why that would be high up there on OP's list. Also, hi, I'm Steven, and if you guys enjoy awesome stories of revenge, why not hit those like and subscribe buttons down below? That said, our next story is, my ex's arbitrary deadline for having kids is coming up, and I want to use my toddler to wish him a happy birthday. So my ex-husband, 29-year-old male, and I, 28-year-old female, haven't seen one another in about three years. And before that, we hadn't seen one another for about two years before that to finalize our divorce. We were high school sweethearts, each other's first everything, and got married right before I turned 21. We disagreed on when to have children. He wanted to start right away, but I wanted to wait until I was 25 to get ourselves situated in life. This led to him cheating, admitting it, and then leaving me. He told me he didn't want to be the 30-year-old with a newborn. When I saw him last, it was to handle a banking issue we both thought was resolved when we separated. I was heavily pregnant with my son when I saw him last at 25. When he saw my very swollen belly, you could see the sadness in his eyes. We were cordial and he congratulated me and my response was, yep, pregnant right when I intended to be, if I were to become pregnant. His face fell a little more. Now he and his new wife have yet to have kids. They married right before the banking issue happened. In all the years we were together, I couldn't tell you when we actually used protection, and I wasn't on birth control. Looking back on it now, I have a feeling my ex is infertile, though I couldn't tell you if, in fact, I am correct in my assumption. Well, I want to send him a happy birthday message for me and my son on his 30th birthday to twist the knife in. He absolutely shattered me. I tried desperately to save my marriage and I'm feeling petty as freak knowing his arbitrary deadline is here and there isn't a child in sight. My son is my world. I have an amazing partner who would move heaven and earth and trek through heck for me and our child. In the end, I did luck out. That doesn't mean I don't still harbor some ill feelings and want to make it known on a day that I know my ex will absolutely remember. I want to do it so bad. But then again, I'd be a terrible mother to use my child in this fashion. I think OP should just take the W where they are and try to be satisfied enough with that. Especially because, like, you don't know what actually is the situation with their relationship. You never know if the wife may have been the one experiencing some health issues and... I'm sure you can imagine how devastating that would be, and OP's revenge might be hurting people more than it's actually helping anybody. And OP's right with the last sentence, do you really just want to use your kids for your own self gain like that? Our next story is, high school bully got his. Growing up, there was a kid in my grade whom I'll call Larry, because that was not his name. Larry and I were on good terms in elementary school. However, when the middle school years came, he decided to be one of my bullies. Fast forward to senior year of high school, all my other bullies had lost interest in me during our sophomore year, but not Larry. One day, he did something truly despicable to me. There was no physical damage to me, but his action showed an astonishing depth of contempt. I did not react in the moment of my humiliation, because any reaction would have been a reward. Cue petty revenge. Remember magazines? Remember those cards and magazines? The ones you could fill out to get a subscription to that or some other magazine? Lots of companies and organizations put those cards in magazines. 
publishers of course, but also the military, non-profits, AARP, you name it. Postage for those cards was paid by the recipient. I started collecting those cards. I collected them from my parents' magazines, from my grandparents' magazines, from any magazine I could get my hands on. When I had a thick stack of them, a couple hundred or more, I started filling them out with Larry's name and address. I then deposited those cards in a mailbox. I never heard what his reaction was, but in addition to the countless subscriptions he had to cancel, I imagine he was on all the mailing lists for years and got an incessant stream of unwanted solicitations. Up yours, Larry. You know, a funny one I've heard about recently is apparently like hair restoration companies are pretty interested in trying to get their clients. So if you can get the information for somebody and fill out something like that, apparently they're more than happy to send these big old advertisements with these examples of hair restoration on there. If you want to try to make somebody not just get like unwanted solicitation, but also maybe embarrassing mail to have to like witness and carry around. Our next story is Revenge on My Stalker. My partner Zex and her friend have stalked my social media pages for the past three years. I thought I'd managed to block them on everything, until she mentioned in one of her many tirades a post I had saved on Pinterest. It took me the longest time to figure out how to private all my boards, but then I decided to make a board especially for my two fans. Here I save inspirational quotes about motherhood, narcissistic exes and stalkers. I didn't realize I would hit such a nerve. It's been quite funny to see her reaction and being called childish, etc. Some of my favorite quotes include, Oh sorry, did I hit a nerve? That's what you get for stalking my page. Narcissists are severely emotionally stunted, underdeveloped adults. Regardless of how high mentally functioning they appear to be, they have the emotional intelligence of an angry, irrational young child. Some people are really so delusional that they think it's disrespectful when you don't just sit back and allow them to continue to disrespect you. And finally, I'm sorry that you're so insecure with yourself and unhappy in your own life that you have to constantly worry about every move that I'm making. I mean, would there be any truth, perhaps, to me suggesting that these people just don't have a life of their own? The fact that they're stalking OP and kind of investing so much of their mental fortitude on what they're doing and them thriving, does that just not suggest that they don't have anything to do most weeknights? Our next story is Revenge on My Neighbors for Not Keeping the Floor Common Area Clean. So I live in an apartment complex and recently a new family moved in. We have a pretty narrow hallway, just wide enough for two people to walk together. Now, these people have two children. Both of them throw their shoes randomly in the hallway. I mostly just kick them, sometimes down the floor so that they keep the inconvenience of climbing down a flight of stairs to get them. The annoying part is that they do the same with their bicycles. Now, these are the bulky ones with the training wheels, two of them. I've asked them to keep the cycles inside their house and it's a fire hazard too, not a major one. We live on the first floor and my family doesn't actually have to cross the cycles or their house to get to the stairs, but I was annoyed regardless of the fact. Now every time I see their cycles in the hallway, I carry them and keep them in their parking, which is about 5 minutes away, but I enjoy being petty. Could I have just warned them again? Yes. Would they have paid heed? No. Plus it's a lot more fun to see them having to get the cycles back. I get why OP is doing this kind of revenge, but I would be careful about picking up somebody else's property and relocating it elsewhere, even if it is still in their parking. The last thing you need is some kind of video going out there of you grabbing their stuff and leaving the building or the hallway with it. Our next story is, try to fool me, enjoy being made a fool. This happened way back when I was in the 7th and cell phones hadn't been made yet. I still live in the same small town. I was on the bus going home talking to my friend, May. The boys behind us were being annoying and trying to listen into our conversation. I got fed up and gave her my home number so we could continue our conversation. Well, unknown to me at the time, one of the boys copied my phone number down. Later on that day, he called and sounded a lot like my friend May. I thought May sounded a little off, but fell for it and told her all my secrets. Very embarrassing secrets that if gotten out would be like committing social suicide. Well the next day I got on the bus to everyone laughing at me and my heart sank. The boy told me he had pretended to be May and I fell for it. I noticed that he had the beginnings of a black eye and a busted lip. May had found out what he did and made sure he knew that she didn't like it and told him that if he ever did something like that again that he would be pushing up daisies. May was a very big and strong girl. 
She didn't tolerate fools. Anyways, I came up with a great idea and prayed for it to work. I smirked at him, which made him uncomfortable. Then I told him loudly so everyone could hear, Dude, I knew it was you the whole time. Everyone knows that my perfect day is being in my apple tree reading a book or writing in my diary. I have old parents that just want to stay home all day and bug me to death and lecture me for hours. Or beat the crap out of me if I do one thing wrong. Do you really think that I would have the urge or courage to do any of the outrageous things I made up and told you about? His face turned red, and the other kids started agreeing with me and saying things like, Now I get why she's a goody two-shoes, or yeah, she's boring. Then it all turned on him for being so gullible, and I never seen him look so humiliated. And I'd always hated being called a goody two-shoes, but right then I was so grateful and so happy that everyone either knew or now knew how bad I had it at home. Oh, and dude is still annoying. This was just a straight up smart way to handle it. OP didn't really have too many other plays to consider other than lie about it or accept that all your secrets are out there. This next story is Revenge on School playing the same song on repeat between 8am and 6pm for 10 days. Firstly, I live in a European country where healthcare is publicly funded. Second, I'm a nurse. Think emergency services. I make 45000 a year and have to work all holidays. Third, I work nights. This college right next to me has this thing every spring where they build floats and do a parade. I'm all for it. Let the kids have fun. They, however, pick a horrible song and blast it in the parking lot, which is right next to our building, from 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. every day for 10 days straight. After a few days, I was desperate for sleep. That week, the weather was beautiful, people were drinking heavily, and many of these required emergency care on top of all the usual cardiac arrests, shootings, and whatnot. I closed the window and died from the heat, but I could still hear it. I had my windows closed and bought earplugs. I could still hear it. I slept two hours before my 10-hour shifts. I called the college and asked to talk to the person in charge, left my details but no one got back to me. I called again the next day and asked to talk to the person in charge. Finally get the man on the line, I explained my problem and asked if they could do something about the volume or change the song. He laughed and said it was tradition. I said I wasn't able to work if I couldn't sleep and asked who was going to pay for my loss of income. He answered that he already did that by paying tax. I asked him a few things about their permits, asked him if he wanted things to go this way. He said yes. I called the police, not emergency number, explained the situation and that he'd said that he was the one paying me my wages. The police did not like that since they get to hear the same thing all the time. Then I referenced a new law about public disturbing with music. The next day, the music was way down. The next year, I couldn't hear it unless I went outside and stood completely still. Turns out I ruined a 50-year-old tradition, and my bench walk got an extra bounce. Do not mess with a sleep-deprived nurse. I guess it depends on how close OP actually was to the college, but to like some degree, I feel like that almost comes with the territory of living close to a school. I've said it before in the past, but I feel like I would be heavily annoyed if I lived a street or two away from a school. There was a time where I visited a friend who did live two streets away from our high school, and right there in his living room, clear as day, you could hear the bell go off from the school. So to think, especially if you worked from home, any weekday during the school year, every hour and a half or so until school lets out, you get this loud bell going off. But even that at least is just like a 10 second bell sound. It doesn't really compare to blaring music for hours on end. Our next story is change numbers to avoid debt collectors. Let me help you with that. I had my phone number stolen from me years ago. Someone convinced Bell they were me and had my number transferred to a new SIM card. I managed to get it back, but decided a number and provider change was the best way to protect myself. It started with the usual texts looking for Edward, I am a woman. When the calls from debt collectors came in, it was quickly obvious I was not him, but they wanted me to get him to call them back. One night, Edward texts me. He's been locked out of his PlayStation account and needs me to text him the code so we can update his phone number with PlayStation. Sure, buddy. Here's your PlayStation code. Is this your new number? For every text or call I received for Edward after that, 
I offered his new number. Within a couple of months, the calls drastically went down. He hasn't contacted me since, so I assume he's been busy dodging bill collectors. Is it more satisfying to know that you sent this guy to his doom with debt collectors getting his new number, or keeping him locked out of his precious PlayStation account? I mean, the debt collector one is just so, like, anti-homey, even though he did use your number. I feel like even just the PlayStation thing would have been annoying enough. Our next story is... Ah, that's a refreshing soda. So I was at the beach with friends at spring break at college, hanging out on the sand during the day. We had like a sort of picnic, a cooler of drinks, mostly beer and soda and lots of chips and dips. We were broke college students and I was from overseas on a student visa and shocked at the prices of stuff, but we all pitched in and got all the food and drink we could, which was not a whole lot with our funds at the time. Everything was great until one guy brings his roommate. He's kind of douchey and annoying, making a big thing out of how he doesn't drink alcohol and is very straight edged, and making comments about us just having a few beers. Also, he didn't buy anything of the food, but ravenously helped himself to everything available. Annoying, but whatever. It's a beach day and I couldn't be bothered to start anything. Not on a beautiful beach in the hot summer sun. He's midway through a massive packet of chips that we had paid for, of course. I see that there's only one soda left in the cooler. Being petty, I take it out and take a big drink. He comes up a few minutes later looking thirsty and is annoyed to see it's only beer left, which he can't drink. I satisfyingly and noisily drink my soda in front of him and say how good it tastes. He spent the rest of the day whining about being thirsty. Considering he didn't give up anything to pay for any of the food, couldn't he have gone and just bought himself one lousy drink if he was that thirsty? Honestly, I bet him complaining was him hoping that somebody else would finally just get fed up enough and go get him a drink. This next story is, so you outraced the older lady. I'll take care of that. I got the opportunity to carry out a small petty revenge this afternoon when I went out for lunch. I went to a local grocery store and picked up a couple of things to eat for lunch. Of course, there were only two lines open, a 20 item or less, and a normal line. I had worked my way up being the next customer in the 20 item line when someone from customer service announced that it was opened to help people. I figured I'd just wait since I was next and that I'd likely be beat over there to check out anyway. I looked up and saw an older lady, late 60s, making her way to customer service. When two college age ladies or kids raced over, getting to the counter just before she did. Anyway, I paid and started walking out to my car, and I hear a conversation start up behind me. Did you see that lady? She was pushing real fast trying to get over there. I know. I, like, ran over there and threw my pretzels on the counter. They were both laughing about it, but seemed to keep following me. I unlocked my car and saw that they were both getting into the car just past mine. I hurried up to get my car started and started backing out real quick, buckling my seatbelt as I backed up. Once I got moving, I took my time backing up and then driving in front of them down the road delaying their opportunity to back out. They back out and quickly catch up to me. With them behind me, I went about as fast as I thought a late 60s grandma would drive until we turned different directions out of the parking lot. It's the small things in life that bring a smile. And to you grandma, I got them back for you. At least a little bit. I'm surprised people like that who were comfortable enough just having that kind of conversation out loud where other people could hear them weren't also the kinds of people that just immediately started laying on the horns. Maybe they were the other kinds of people who decided now's the time to just flip through their notifications until this old geezer finally moves. And don't mind them, they'll start moving once the person behind them reminds them with the horn that they're in a moving vehicle and it's time to stop looking at the phone. Our next story is, won't stop calling me to collect someone else's debt? How would you like their new phone number and address? Oopsie, hung up on ya. A tale as old as time. You get a new phone and it blows up with calls from debt collectors. Most people can just send unknown callers to voicemail. I unfortunately worked tech support for a large company at the time, so I had to answer every call. I'll spare you the details of how annoying those folks are. Very should suffice. And I got tired of it pretty darn quick. I put up with it as long as I could, but then something broke. I needed to freak with these jerks in as much as it was possible and legal to do so. Mostly, I just wasted as much of their time as I could, but for the really annoying ones, I had a routine that I developed over the course of about a year. This is my petty revenge in the form of a dialogue. 
Dunner says, is this Joe Detter? I reply, is this about the unpaid phone bill from 2010? Dunner says, yes, Mr. Detter. Are you going to pay? I cut him off and say, hang on a sec. I never said I was your dude. I work with him though. He sold me this phone a couple of weeks ago and told me I might be getting a few of these calls. Listen, could you please just call him directly? I can give you his new address and phone number and the phone for our HR department if you want that too. Dunner replied, that would be wonderful, thank you. I say, are you ready to write this down? It's click. Invariably, they'd call back thinking I had just accidentally disconnected. I'd say something like, sorry, cell coverage sucks around here, I apologize. Do you still want me to click? You'd be surprised how many times they'd try again. I answered and pretended to accidentally hang up every single time. They all eventually figured it out. Not before getting really angry though. I mean, it doesn't surprise me, debt collectors being debt collectors, that they would try a surprising number of times. I mean, that's kind of like their whole thing, right? Is at any cost, get a hold of this person and try to get any amount of money from them. Jay Hawker Pilot said, I have a deadbeat sister. Like, I don't think she has ever paid a single bill ever. When the bill collectors would call, my response was, If you find her, call me back with her phone number and address. She owes me money. And I said it at 100 plus decibels, sounding ticked. I never got a call back, ever. Blonde hearted goddess responded, Dude, I'll use this next time one calls me looking for my ex-husband. We divorced over 20 years ago and I still get calls. He does owe me alimony, about $20. It was a token amount just in case he won the lottery, the door would be open. Not that he'd ever tell me though. Our next story is, you ding my car, you suffer the minor inconveniences. My girlfriend and I were out to pick up a quick little brunch where we live in a smaller country town. Big trucks, some yeehaw, etc. I had parked my small two-door hatchback, dead smack in the middle of a parking spot, out in front of the eatery backing up to the curb with no car on either side. We got back into the car with our food and as I was getting settled, securing our food for the road, locking in the promise of a tasty future and buckling up, a well-equipped lifted pickup truck speedily pulls in forward on my driver's side. This truck, of course, is right on the line between our parking spots. Okay, Captain, but you could do better. Anyways, I turned my head to watch the driver get out of their tinted window truck and then bang. Little bang, but bang, this redneck, crack-smoking looking 30-something-year-old opens his door right into the side of my car, then belligerently oozes his fat, bloated belly down out of his truck, looking me dead in the face and chuckles, then walks off with his trailer-trash-looking girlfriend who had been watching after she exited from their passenger side. She then smiles too, looking at me and they go inside. Okay, freak you too. I check for a mark and thankfully my car was unscathed to the naked eye. They can't even ding a car right. But I didn't appreciate them hitting my car and then laughing while their empty, non-thinking eyes met my scowl. Well, my girlfriend and I have some hot sandwiches and some time to kill. So I turned my engine on, pulled out and right back into my spot, leaving such a tiny gap this truck driver's bulbous beer gut would have claustrophobic nightmares about. We enjoyed our breakfast sandwiches in my car while I excitedly bubbled in anticipation for these buffoons return. I didn't much care for the flavor of the smoky bacon added on my sandwich, but still a 6.5 out of 10. As I was set to finish my last couple bites, in perfect timing, the bird's nest haired passenger wearing her stained baggy sweatpants, spaghetti strap tank top and worn out crocs, in what must have been 4 degrees celsius, stomps in front of my car. Move your freaking car! As I watch her, a smile grows on my face and grows wider still when I see this huffing and puffing man in my rearview mirror, standing arms crossed and hopeless to enter his vehicle. They weren't smiling anymore, casually chewing and swallowing my last bite of my brunch. It somehow tasted better in this moment as I was starting to taste the sweetness of my little petty revenge. I rolled down my window to politely inform them that they had dinged my car and should be careful next time. Like a petulant child being naughty, she begins yelling out, No we didn't, no we didn't. Relax, I'm not going to put you in time out. I assure them that the driver did indeed and they know it. I reiterated for them to be careful next time. They continue yelling out, we didn't, move your freaking car. 
and so on while they grow red in the face. Now I'm the one with a big grin, and they are butt hurt. I take my time to get my car turned on and crawl out of the parking spot, giving them a surely photo-worthy joyous smile with pearly whites, dimples and all. They dinged my car with no sense of accountability or any kind of sorry, so I took up just a couple of minutes of their time and soured their mood. I made sure not to stick around because I didn't want these crow magnets following me back home, as they seemed the type to do something stupid, and I had my girlfriend's safety to look after too. Learn to drive and not be imprudent. That is the long-winded story of my petty revenge. Truly petty, but I don't blame OP. The only thing is, I would be afraid somebody like that, they're gonna decide, alright, well I'm just gonna try to jump on their trunk or something. As long as they have some semblance of moving, a guy described with that kind of mass probably could do some damage. Our next story is, I am the jerk and a decade later, I'm still not sorry. This is an ancient tale of mine, but it crossed my mind this morning and felt this community might appreciate my youthful, jerk-ish decision making. I'm currently 31 year old female, but it all started when I was 20-ish. There was a horrific, traumatic loss in my life. As I was down spiraling in grief, I moved in with my older cousin Amy, who I had generally always been close with. She had a munchkin who was almost one at the time. I ended up living with them for about three years until the night it all fell apart. At the time it all unraveled, I worked midnights. I would keep my midnight sleep schedule during the week, but would flop to a normal sleep schedule on weekends so I could spend as much time with my boyfriend as possible. As he had to drive an hour, one way, just to visit weekly. Pure chaos, but I was thriving, so whatever. I survived. The night it all went down was the night I was flopping from midnight's life to the normal human sleep schedule, so I'd been awake for almost 24 hours by 8pm. Myself, my boyfriend, Amy, Amy's boyfriend Steve, and our mutual friend were all gathering at our place for some drinks. When Steve arrived, he took Amy so they could get a top up of booze before we cracked anything open. They said they'd be 30 minutes tops and asked us to wait. 40 minutes went by. I texted to see how far off they were. The answer I got was vague. Whatever, Amy is weird like that sometimes. I texted again at an hour, then 15 minutes after that. Another text at an hour and a half. Always vague responses without any real information. I was getting frustrated. Again, we weren't going to start drinking until they got back. They knew this. And more importantly, Amy knew that if I didn't get some booze in me by 9 to 9.30, I'd be down for the count. I made sure to remind her of this several times. The booze was what was going to keep me conscious for the night. I'd have started drinking without her if she told me she was going to be a while, but she didn't tell me what was happening or give any indication of a time frame. Even when I'd specifically ask, we just sat around, miffed, thinking Amy and Steve were right around the corner to be back at any moment. When they finally came back through the door, over two hours later, They had Steve's dog as a surprise. I don't remember what I said, but I yelled. I was freaking furious at how inconsiderate of a decision that was. And my tired state didn't help with my emotional regulation. I mean, sure, get the dog. But tell us you'll be a bit and that we should start drinking without you. Not that you'll be right back and to just wait. After the hour mark, I honestly only stayed awake to rip her a new one. She didn't understand why I was so mad. We argued briefly before I just went to bed, but the argument continued the next day. During that bit, she threatened that if I left, she'd never let me see her daughter again. That was it. Decision made. I won't let you use your daughter like that with me, and I won't subject myself to that sort of manipulation. I started re-examining her past behavior as I packed and realized, Amy was never a good person. She was always cruel and rude whenever the opportunity would present itself, no matter who she was speaking to. Once at a mutual friend's birthday party, she directly told the birthday girl, who was a large woman, that she should never lose weight because then she'd be prettier than her. Similarly, she seemed very frustrated when I went through an insane fitness shape and was suddenly in better shape than her. Amy never helped with my depression or grief like I'd convinced myself she did. In fact, she pretty much flat out ignored it. Even when I told her I was having... thoughts. Amy was a bully. Meaner than Regina George kind of bully. It wasn't the first time she showed her true colors, but it was the first time I could consciously see her for who she was. With all that, and a million other consistently toxic and selfish memories ranging from childhood to adulthood, I moved out within the next 48 hours. 
But uh, here's where I become the jerk of this story. I took something that was technically not mine. It was something I'd gifted her a month before for Christmas. You see, I bought a really nice, really considerate and expensive gift for my loving, caring cousin who supported me through many trying times in my life. But while re-examining everything on that last day, I realized that Amy had none of those qualities. She wasn't nice. She was mean. She wasn't considerate. She was self-absorbed. And she was about as supportive as damp cardboard. The woman I thought Amy was never existed in the first place. Since my gift was for someone who apparently didn't exist, I freaking took it with me. I know that it 5,000% makes me a jerk. And I don't think I'd make the same choices were I able to do it over, but I still don't regret taking that $1,000 couch with me. It's still in my living room a decade later. Not sorry. I can't blame OP one bit. If you felt like your world was crashed and you had a realization about somebody who was supposed to be this amazing supportive person and you realized, I need to get out of here. I'd be taking the $1,000 couch I technically bought for them with me too. Let's be real, a thousand dollar couch and you put it in your shared apartment? I think you can swing to anybody that it was yours and you paid for it. But with that being said, that's all the time we have for today. Now if you want to hear another awesome revenge story, check out that video on the left. Or if you missed my latest video, check out that video on the right. That said, I'll see you all next time with some more stories.